things in your precious name. We pray, amen. And all God's people said, amen. Well, it's good to be with you, Trinity family. Good morning. Welcome to those of you who are joining us for the first time, either uh, here in person or perhaps online. We're glad that you are with us as we are continuing in our study of the Gospel of Mark. Uh, if you've been around for this series, uh, you know that three chapters into Mark's Gospel, uh, Jesus is the rock star. He really is. I mean, if you're looking at this simply from a humanistic level, Jesus is the rock star. I mean, his miracles are drawing the masses. Uh, but what we're going to see today uh, in Mark chapter 4 is that what Jesus does after he draws a crowd is very different than what any leader of almost any movement today would do. Uh, see, if a leader today starts drawing a huge crowd, that leader is almost immediately thinking about how to grow that crowd even larger the next time they gather. Right? Because big crowds and big numbers are a big deal to most leaders. Uh, but Jesus didn't really care about big crowds. We see this all throughout the gospel accounts, actually. In fact, on one occasion in John chapter 6, Jesus turned a mega church of 5,000 into a small group of 12 with one sermon. <laughs> now, I preach some bad sermons, but I've never turned a mega church of 5,000 into a small group of 12 with one sermon. Jesus, he did that. He he turned a mega church of 5,000 people into a small group of 12 with one sermon. After he stopped miraculously making bread for the people to eat, and instead he told the people he's the bread that they need to eat, at which point the entire crowd left, leaving only the 12 disciples with him. And yet in that moment, Jesus does not even flinch. He looks at the 12 and he says, what about you? Do you want to leave too? Do you want to leave too? At which point Peter says, where would we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Well, my point is that Jesus doesn't even flinch when that crowd of 5,000 turn, turns into a small group of 12. See, big crowds were not a big deal to Jesus. And this is in contrast to so many in our culture, in our society, who are consumed with how large the crowd is, like politicians, performers, and sadly, even some pastors. Right? But big crowds were not a big deal to Jesus. Which is why Jesus does not pander to the big crowd when one gathers to hear him. No, Jesus actually uses the occasion of a big crowd as an opportunity to bring some tough teaching, right? To sort out the faithful followers from the fair weather fans. You're going to see this pattern today in Mark chapter 4. This huge crowd is gathered around Jesus, at which point Jesus preaches one of the most unseeker sensitive messages of all time. Take a listen. This is Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. The words will be on the screen if you don't have your Bible. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake, while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching he said, listen, a farmer went out to sow a seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was 
sown. Now, right out of the gate, if you're following along in your notes, I want you to see in verse 1 that the setting for this teaching by Jesus is a huge crowd. Look again at verse 1. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large, so large. This was a big crowd. A huge crowd has gathered. And yet, instead of Jesus giving them an inspiring little pep talk to sort of, you know, boost up the morale of the troops, Jesus instead tells this parable about how some of them will very likely fall away, bailing on him. Which again is not exactly the best PR move for building morale within a movement. I mean, I mean, I don't understand what Jesus is doing here. Doesn't he, doesn't he care that all these people have come out? Isn't he excited that this crowd has gathered? Isn't he excited that there's more and more people who are gathering to hear him who, who could be potentially part of this movement? Let me take a moment and just say something personally, parenthetically, transparently. Over the past few months, there have been a lot of new folks coming to Trinity. And in some cases, beginning a journey with Jesus. In some cases, renewing a commitment to follow Jesus. And let me be clear, I'm so encouraged by this. I hope we see more of that in the days, weeks, months, and years to come. Amen? But folks, I believe Jesus has a gracious warning and a question for us through Mark chapter 4 today. A gracious warning and a question for us. Here's the, here's the gracious warning, here's the question. See, there is a point when the excitement of being a part of his movement will fade, and then the question that remains is this. Will we keep following Jesus even after the newness has worn off? Will we keep following Jesus after the euphoria has worn off? Right? Will we keep following Jesus even after the newness has worn off. The other thing I want you to keep in mind as we look at this parable this morning is that Jesus is not just warning the crowd about the dangers and the temptations that will lead them to falling away. He's not just warning the crowd. He's also warning his disciples. He's also forewarning his disciples about what will happen when they share the gospel with people. Right? That's part of what he's doing here in unpacking this parable to his disciples. See, Jesus is giving his disciples a heads up that there will be some people who will hear the gospel who will immediately reject it. They're just going to immediately reject it. There will be others who hear the gospel, Jesus says, who will initially get excited about it. They'll receive it with joy, but they will eventually bail. And there will be others who hear it, Jesus says, who will seem to receive it. Maybe they do receive it, but they're going to get distracted by the things of this world such that they'll become spiritually stagnant. They won't bear the kind of spiritual fruit that was intended. One of the things that I hope you take away from this parable is that when people you love, when people you care about reject Jesus or bail on Jesus, you don't need to beat yourself up over what you could have or should have you think you should have done to try to stop it. Because your job, like the farmer's job in this parable, is to sow the seed, not try to make people follow Jesus. I hope you take away that message from this parable this morning. You know, years ago, I struggled when someone who started out following Jesus eventually bailed on Jesus. It was gut-wrenching for me personally because I didn't want to quote-unquote lose anyone. And that was the way I kind of saw it. I didn't want to lose anyone. And some of my angst really was, it was born out of this genuine care for people's souls. But if I'm honest, another part of it, if I'm honest, was also born out of my pride. It was born out of my pride in that I didn't want to see anyone fall away on my watch. I didn't want to see anyone in my sphere of influence stop following Jesus. I didn't want to see anyone in my sphere of influence bail on Jesus. And it kind of, messed me up inside, which is, I think, in part why the Lord brought me back to this very parable, to remind me of what happens, to remind me of what always happens, no matter how strategic, how careful, how winsome, how loving we are in the way we share the word with people. Some will respond to the word, and others will reject the word, either immediately or eventually. That's always what happens. Some will respond to the word, others will reject the word, either immediately or eventually. And because you and I don't know who will respond or reject God's word, we should not be selective. We should not be stingy about where we sow the seed of God's word. We should not be stingy or selective about who we share 
God's word with, who we share the gospel with. We should take our lead from the farmer. Right? Listen, Jesus says in verse 3, a farmer went out to sow his seed. And according to the parable, this farmer is not all that concerned about wasting his seed. I mean, did you notice that? He's throwing it all over the place, even in places where it's not very likely to take root. And again, let me be clear. I know I'm new to the Midwest. I'm new to farming country. But even I know that is not the way you farm. It's not very efficient. It's a waste. Any farmers, give me an amen. Like, am I on the right track here? All right, that was a little bit more than I usually get. Okay, I tapped into the farming constituency here. <laughs> That's good. They were in the first service. I like that. I did get a better reaction from the first service. It's true. <laughs> David Garland writes this. I love this, folks. The parable portrays a sower who sows with abandon, casting seed upon a pathway, rocks and thorns, as well as on good ground, which is why, here it is, which is why the rate of failure is not surprising. This is why the rate of failure is not surprising. Folks, three out of the four soils in Jesus' parable where this farmer's casting seed is marked by what we would probably call failure. Right Now, to a recovering perfectionist who wants to make sure that I don't lose anyone, who wants to make sure I don't waste anything, I don't like this 75% failure rate. Those of you who are getting to know me, I don't like to fail 75% of the time at anything. Right? And especially if I'm casting God's seed, especially if I'm sharing the gospel, I, I want to see that seed take root. I want to see people respond. But one of the things that Jesus is teaching me through this parable, one of the things I believe Jesus wants to teach us through this parable is that it's not our job to dictate how people respond. Our job is simply to sow the seed of God's word. Even among those who will reject or eventually bail on him. And by the way, I've been wrong many times about who would stick with Jesus and who would bail on Jesus, which is why I know it's really important for me to stay in my own lane. It's really important for me to not try to judge the soil of other people's hearts. It's simply my job to sow the seed of God's word and to then let the soil of people's hearts be revealed by how they respond to God's word over the long haul. You hear what I'm saying? It's not my job to judge other people's hearts. It's not my job to try to evaluate the soil of other people's hearts. It's my job to sow the seed of God's word and to let the soil of other people's hearts be revealed by how they respond to God's word over the long haul. Now, let me be clear on this next point, this caveat, this disclaimer, because I was really concerned that I not preach this message in a way where you would miss this. Should we still be sad when people bail on Jesus or grow stagnant in their relationship with Jesus? Absolutely. Should we be sad when people bail on Jesus or seemingly bail on Jesus? Absolutely. It should break our hearts. And Christ commands us in places like Matthew 18 that, that we should go after them, that we should seek to bring them back into the fold when they stray. But at the end of the day, friends, if they refuse to respond, we need to remember that Jesus said this would happen. He forewarned us that this was coming. Right? And he was graciously giving a warning to the perfectionists like us in the room. Look at verse 15. Jesus warned us this would be the case. Verse 15 says, some people, Jesus says, are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. In other words, there are some who will hear God's word and they're just not going to get it. Either because they don't understand it or because, as Romans 1 says, they don't want to understand it. They just don't want to understand it. Right? There are some people who don't want to be told that they are sinners in need of a Savior. They don't want to be told that there is a holy and perfect God and that the only way that he can restore us to himself is through Christ's work on the cross, bearing our sins, dying in our place. To some people, that message sounds like crazy talk. It just sounds absolutely bizarre, which is why Paul says to the Corinthians, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Paul was a smart dude, right? He, he wasn't a knuckle dragon Neanderthal. He was a smart guy, but he knew that this message of the cross, that it would sound like foolishness to those who would reject it. Some people just don't want to hear 
that message because it confronts them with the reality of their sin and some people in their pride just don't want to see themselves as sinners who need a savior. Or as Jesus says in verse 15, some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Jesus says there are folks who will initially hear this word and they'll just outright reject it right out of the gate. Now Jesus goes on to say there are other folks who will initially receive the word who will eventually fall away. Look at verse 16 and 17. Others, he says, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. You know, except for the grace of God, that would have been my story. Truly, except for the grace of God, that would have been my story. When I first heard the gospel, I received it, like this person in verse 16 received it, with joy. I remember I was on this spiritual mountaintop. I was on cloud nine. I was experiencing this euphoria of this new relationship with the God of the universe who loved me so much that he sent Jesus to die in my place and then rise from the dead three days later. This validation of who he is and what he did for me. Like I just remember that euphoria that sense of God's presence. And then one morning in August of 1992, I woke up and I found myself in what some of you heard me describe as my dark night of the soul, where God seemed absolutely distant. And where for the next 18 months, I struggled with depression and doubts and questions about whether Christianity even had an intellectual leg to stand on. Or if this religion that I had just signed on to was really one where you checked your brain at the door and you drank the blue Kool-Aid on your way in. Right, that's what I I wondered. And, And the temptation for me during those 18 months was to bail on Jesus because of how dark and difficult my life had become since following Jesus. I had not signed up for dark and difficult when I decided to follow Jesus. I thought Jesus was supposed to make my life easier. I thought Jesus was supposed to make my life easier. But thank God for his word as I continued to search the scriptures during those 18 months, I discovered that trials are actually part of how God tests us. And not that God was trying to flunk me. That's not why God tests us. No, God tests us to refine us. He was testing me to refine me. He was testing me to prepare me for kingdom assignments that he had in mind for me. Satan uses these tests to get us to bail on Jesus. God and Satan are both real interested in tests but with very different end games in mind. Satan wants to flunk us. He wants to get us discouraged and despair and bail on Jesus. God was using these tests to refine me and to prepare me for the kingdom of assignments that he had in mind for me. He was growing me to this place where my following Jesus was not contingent on my feeling Jesus. Are you with me? He He was moving me to this place where my following Jesus was not contingent on my ability to feel Jesus. In fact, I remember coming to this place of resolve somewhere during that 18 months, or that dark night of my soul, where I committed to follow Jesus even if I struggled with doubts and depression for the rest of my life. See, for a while I thought, I gotta get out of this darkness, I gotta get out of this depression, I gotta get out of these questions, and then I'll really be able to follow Jesus. And at some point it was like, I I think I'm supposed to just follow him regardless. And so I I did. I just prayed a very simple prayer like, Jesus, I didn't sign on to this. I didn't think I was signing on to this. But I believe you are who you say you are, enough so that I'm going to trust you and I'm going to follow you even if these doubts and this depression is what marks my life from here on out. And I say that with a, a bit of hesitancy, folks, because I don't want to in any way minimize the pain that some of you are feeling right now who can relate to what I've just described. But I do wonder if some of you need to come to a similar place of resolve this morning. That you will follow Jesus no matter what. That you'll follow Jesus no matter what, even if your life doesn't play out like you thought it would or think it should. And by Making a resolve, folks, I'm not talking about gritting your teeth and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, but through the power of preaching the gospel to yourself. 
on a daily, maybe hourly, maybe minute by minute basis, preaching the gospel to yourself, literally out loud, saying out loud something like this, Jesus, you are so glorious. And what you did on the cross for me is so amazing. And what you're preparing for me in your kingdom is so incredible that you're worth following. You're worth following regardless of the trials that come my way. For some of you, that might even be the step you need to take this morning. In fact, I wonder if for some of you, you can just check out for the rest of this message. You just need to get your phone out, take a picture of that prayer, and start praying something like that as you preach the gospel to yourself in the midst of whatever difficult circumstances you're walking through. For some of you, you don't need to hear anything else in this message. You just know that's the next step I need to take. I need to preach the gospel to myself. I need to preach the gospel to myself. Well, there's a third group of people that Jesus says will hear the word. He says they'll initially receive it, but eventually they'll be distracted by things in this world that will choke out the word in their lives. Look at verses 18 and 19. Jesus says, still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Now, my guess is that this is where most of us in this room are inclined to fall prey, this third soil, right? My guess is that most of us in this room will not altogether bail on Jesus, like just outright reject him. My guess is that most of us in this room, that won't be our temptation. But for many of us, earthly desires or the desire for things or worries, anxieties, and the like, they're, they're the things that are going to choke out the word in us such that while we might not bail on Jesus altogether, our lives will not have much impact for Jesus. Our lives will not have much impact for God's kingdom because our hearts are divided. Our affections are divided. Our commitments and our loyalties are divided. For example, instead of trusting God with our future and our finances, some of us will be tempted to hold on to more of our money because we're trying to obtain for ourselves that security that can only be ultimately found in God. Right? I mean, that's, that's what Jesus is going after here. He mentions specifically the deceitfulness of riches because we, we have this tendency to try to find security in what we can obtain for ourselves instead of finding ultimate security in God alone. Just a moment of transparency on this point. Finding our security in God is one of the main lessons that God was teaching Amanda and me during our first 13 years or so of marriage. We had very little money, but we had lots of stories of God's provision, which built up our faith, which encouraged us to look to God for what we needed, which I think is in part why we were content living in a parsonage, driving an old car, receiving hand-me-down clothes for the kids, but then I became the pastor of a large church with a much larger salary, which allowed us to buy a house, something we had never thought would be part of our story. And then upon moving into this house, the strangest thing happened. Some of you know exactly where I'm going. I found myself thinking an awful lot about this house and this 30-year mortgage that I just signed on to. Are you with me? Some of you are with me. And I, I want to be really clear on this point. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with buying a house. Frankly, I think buying a house is a usually fantastic stewardship move. But I will say for us, at least initially for us, it for a while made it harder to focus on Jesus and his kingdom with that house and that mortgage. And again, let me just say it a different way. I'm not saying that the solution to what Jesus is describing here is to take a vow of poverty no, as I read the word of God, I believe the best antidote against the deceitfulness of wealth is not a vow of poverty, but generosity. There's a difference, right? I'm talking about generosity, not a vow of poverty. Let me illustrate this distinction. Let me illustrate this point. And I have Amanda's permission to tell this story. Uh, shortly after we bought that house, the enemy started to stir worry, in particular, into Amanda's heart about our finances. And again, some of that anxiety was related to the fact that we had just signed on to this 30-year mortgage. But Amanda knew, like cognitively, intellectually, that her anxiety didn't make sense. I mean, not in light of our new financial situation or in light of the many chapters of God's provision over the course of our marriage, 
And yet here we were with more money than we'd ever had, with greater financial margin than we'd ever had before, and yet with more anxiety about our finances. Well, here was Amanda's response regarding this worry and this anxiety that Jesus said would be a temptation, this worry and this anxiety that Jesus said could trip us up. I remember, I don't know if this is a direct quote, but, but she said something about like, like this. She was you know, calling out the, the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, and she said something like this. I think we just need to give this year's tax refund away as a way of renouncing the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of riches and to declare that we trust in Jesus. And I remember she said it, and I just thought, preach it, girl. I was like, that, that sounds like, that's good. Most of you already know I married up. This is just like illustration 78 of that <laughs> fact, right? And again, I hope that this doesn't sound pharisaical in the way that I'm telling this story, because my intent is not to highlight our generosity, but rather to illustrate the deceitfulness of wealth that Jesus is talking about here, that while money can be a tremendous blessing, worry and anxiety and the desire for more so often comes with it, such that if we don't combat that spirit of materialism with generosity, folks, it will eat our lunch. I mean, Jesus is warning us it'll eat our lunch. As he says here in verse 19, the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and they'll choke the word, making it unfruitful. Jesus is warning us about that very reality. So if you're worrying too much about money, even though logically you know you have enough, maybe you just need to give some of it away, right? As a way of renouncing the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of riches, and as a way of reminding yourself that you're putting your trust in Jesus. And let me be clear, I'm not making a play for you to give to Trinity. We got a lot we could be doing around here so you could give it to Trinity if you want to, but I'm, not, I'm making a play on your soul. And I'm not trying to be melodramatic, I'm just trying to be honest about what Jesus is saying here. Right? This is a real warning. It's a real warning, and he's saying it out of love. So if you need to give it to another ministry that's proclaiming Christ, staying true to his word, do it. Like, if you're in that place where you're just like, I'm worrying so much about my money, and yet logically I know I have enough, I'm not telling you to take a vow of poverty. I'm saying maybe generosity is the antidote to that. Folks, Jesus wraps this whole parable up in verse 20 with this. It's only one verse long when he's talking about the good soil, but he says it this way. He says, others like seeds sown on good soil hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. Right? In other words, the seed of the gospel will produce a harvest when it's planted in a heart that has received God's grace and is now responsive to God's word. In fact, Jesus says it's our ongoing response to God's word that is the factor that will determine whether or not there will be kingdom fruit born out of our lives, individually and corporately. Right? See, the key for us as individuals, the key for us corporately, the key for us as a church, the key to producing kingdom fruit is not whether or not we're doing the latest or greatest program. It's not what kind of worship music we're doing or not doing. It's not even about whether we're doing this kind or that kind of evangelism strategy. And I'm not saying that those things are unimportant. I'm not saying those things are unimportant. No, I'm just saying that the key to producing kingdom fruit is becoming a church that is responsive to God's word where we not only hear it, but we keep responding to it, Jesus says, with our whole lives and for our whole lives. We keep responding to it with our whole lives and for our whole lives. See, as we consistently study the word of God, as we consistently respond to the word of God, we will individually and corporately produce lasting fruit for the kingdom of God. Which is why every Sunday morning at the end of our study of God's word, I, also, I always ask a question that sounds something like this. Okay, so then what does it mean now for us to respond to this portion of God's word? What does it look like now for us to take next steps in response to this portion of God's word? Not just hear it. Did you notice everyone in the parable heard it? Everyone in the parable heard the word. But not everyone responded to it. Not everyone in the parable applied it the word over the long haul. In fact, I was so struck by this as I studied this parable this past week that I made a list of application points from this parable just so that I could make sure that I was doing 
what this parable, I think, calls us to. Here are a few of the application points that really stood out for me. Number one, failure is not optional. It's inevitable. Failure is not optional. It's inevitable. Right? This is an application point from this parable for the perfectionists in the room, like me. Right? If Jesus said there will be people who will reject him, who at some point will decide to bail him, that's going to happen. It's going to happen, friends, regardless of how deeply I don't want it to happen, regardless of how much I try to not let it happen. Some of you need to remember this as you reach out to people in your sphere of influence, as you reach out to people even that you deeply care about. And again, don't misunderstand me. Does Jesus want you to reach out to people? Absolutely. Right? He wants you to be the, like the farmer in this parable where you're throwing out the seed liberally, not trying to figure out if the soil of their hearts is at just the right condition that they'll receive it. We don't know. I'm not saying that you don't have any sense of strategy in mind. I'm just saying don't get so locked up into thinking that you're going to figure it out. That's why Jesus tells this parable about a farmer who's throwing out the seed liberally. Jesus wants you to be like that with the people in your lives. And frankly, so do I. So do I. In fact, I love the conversations I'm having with many of you about friends that you're inviting to church, some of whom are coming some of whom might even be here today. I met a few in the first service. I love it that you're following Jesus in that very specific way of reaching out to those in your sphere of influence. That's part of what it means to have Christ's heart. That's part of what it means to have Christ's heart. Just remember, it's not up to you to make them follow Christ, which leads me to number two. I need Christ's heart and mind regarding people who will reject him or will bail on him. See, there have been seasons in my life when I've had Christ's heart for those who bail on him, but I didn't have Christ's mind. I didn't really understand the nature of God's kingdom, which is why God brought me back to this parable. I didn't have this understanding of the nature of God's kingdom, that it was not ultimately up to me whether or not someone trusted Christ or kept following Christ which is why I would get all twisted up inside trying to figure out what I needed to do to win them over or win them back. And my sense is that some of you in this room know exactly what I'm talking about because you get all twisted up inside because you're trying to figure out what you need to do to win them over or win them back. And again, as I said, it's absolutely biblical. It's absolutely appropriate. It's absolutely reflective of Christ's heart to go after those who are lost or who have strayed. Christ calls us to that in places like Matthew 18. But we are to do so. We're to go after people with this trusting, obeying God disposition. Not out of anxiety, not out of pride, not out of this spirit of perfectionism that says, I will not lose anyone because they're not mine to lose. Which leads me to number three, it's not about me. It's not about me, it's about the word of God. It's about whether or not people will respond to his word. Yes, I get to play a part in the sowing of God's word in people's lives, but it's not ultimately about me. David Garland says it this way. He says, as sowers, we can take no credit for any success that comes from our sowing, nor need we beat ourselves down for any failure. You you get that? We don't get any success. We don't get any failure. That's not a scorecard. That's not the scorecard that we should be using. Let me illustrate what this uh, might look like, or at least an example. Back in Washington State, someone in our neighborhood that we've been praying for and reaching out to told us that he didn't want us to reach out to him anymore. Right? We'd invited him over to our home for dinner. We had invited him to church, at which point he told us in no uncertain terms that he didn't want us reaching out to him anymore. Later that same week, I had lunch with someone else who was not yet a follower of Jesus either, and over lunch, I had the chance to share the gospel with him. And he was very receptive, so much so that right there in that restaurant, I asked him if he wanted to receive Christ's forgiveness and become Christ's follower. And right there in that restaurant, he prayed to take that step. Now, here's my point in telling these two two stories. I didn't beat myself up over my neighbor who didn't want anything to do with Jesus, and I didn't take any credit for the guy who decided to become a follower of Jesus because neither one was about me. Neither one is about me. My job is not to make someone follow Jesus. My job is simply to sow the seed. Which is probably why I love the story of the young pastor who led an imprisoned criminal to Christ. 
after the prisoner became a Christian, he told that young pastor, now preacher, don't go getting a big head because I've accepted Christ. You're just the 25th man. You're just the 25th man. Now, on asking the prisoner what that meant, the prisoner told the pastor that 24 other guys had shared the gospel with him before he did, and that his conversion to Christ was the result of all of them sharing Christ with him. Right? Folks, you and I, we may not get to be the 25th man, but that's not really the point. That's not really the point. It's not about you and me. It's not about us. It's not about me. I can't make people respond my job is to simply sow the seed of God's word, which leads me to number four. The seed will produce a harvest. The seed will produce a harvest when it's sown in a heart that has received God's grace and is responsive to God's word. Right? Jesus says so in verse 20. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. In other words, the power resides in the seed, not in us. And that's good news, folks. That should free us. It should free us from pride on the one hand, and it should free us from despair on the other. The power resides in the seed, not in us. The seed of God's word is so powerful then that we need to find ways to share it with people. Right? Whether verbally, one-on-one, -on -one, or in small group Bible study, or sharing verses through text message, or even, you know, that thing called a good old-fashioned snail letter, right? The power is in the seed. The power is in God's Word. The Word of God is living and active, Hebrews 4.12 says. It's God-breathed, 2 Timothy 3.16 says. This, this is what has the power to transform lives, which is why my job every Sunday as we gather, is to open up this book so that we can hear what God has said and then encourage us to respond to what God has said because the seed will produce a harvest when it's planted in a heart that has received God's grace and is responsive to God's word. And so with that said, friends, let me invite us to consider a few potential next steps this morning so that we don't, you know, become guilty of Missing the very thing that Jesus is calling us to, which is this responsiveness to his word. Number one, has your heart received God's grace? Has your heart received God's grace such that you're overjoyed with all that God has done for you through Christ's death on the cross, dying in your place, rising from the dead as vindication that what he did on the cross really did take Right, forgiving your sins, adopting you into his family, making you an heir in his coming kingdom. Friends, if you have not received that grace, then I would invite you to turn to Jesus right now. Call on him as Savior and Lord of your life and receive his grace. It's available right now, right where you are. Simply turn to him, turn from your sin, call on him as Savior and Lord and receive this grace. Number two, maybe you've already received God's grace. Maybe you would say, I'm a Christian. But maybe you would also say that your faith is too easily distracted or discouraged by the trials of this life, by the worries of this life, by the cares of this life, sometimes even to the point where you're tempted to bail on Jesus. Maybe you don't say it out loud, but inside you're like, if I get to this point, I'm done. Right? If that's where you are, then maybe your next step today is to draw a line in the sand or to draw a line in the soil, if you will, and commit yourself to following Jesus no matter what. And again, not by gritting your teeth or by pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. This is not a self-help deal, guys. No, the power, the power to follow through on that resolve is from God. It's through the gospel, and that's why it's important. And some of you, I think this is your next step, to preach the gospel to yourself, to literally maybe on a daily basis to say out loud something like this, Jesus, you are so glorious. And what you did for me on the cross is so amazing. And what you're preparing for me in heaven is so incredible that you're worth following. You're worth following regardless of whatever trials come my way. For some of you, that's your next step. And then finally, for some of you, your next step today is to accept this word of freedom from Jesus. To accept this word of freedom from Jesus in this parable that it's not about you 
you and it's not up to you to make someone trust Jesus or to make someone keep following Jesus. No, your job, my job, our job is to simply sow the word into people's lives. Right? Throwing the seed like the farmer in this parable wherever and to whoever. Not so concerned to try to evaluate the condition of the soil of that person's heart, but trusting that the soil of that person's heart will be revealed over the long haul as they respond or don't respond to God's word. Because it's the seed, friend, that has the power to produce a harvest. When it's planted in a heart that has received God's grace and is responsive to God's word. So as the worship team comes to lead us in our closing song, let's receive God's grace anew and let's respond to God's word fully. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for what you have done for us in Christ. I would just pray right now, Lord, that for anyone in this room, anyone watching online who has never received this grace, that they would hear this invitation not just from a guy standing on a platform with a mic on, but from you, your Holy Spirit, right now, issuing this invitation to listen. Just like you say in this parable, listen, hear. And that they would turn to you and receive what you've done for them. Lord, you know others of us in this room, we are struggling. We've got circumstances and situations that are difficult, that are discouraging, that in some cases are even tempting us to either bail on you or to curtail your work in our life to just this Sunday morning little window. Lord, I pray that you would open up our eyes, just like we sang a few minutes ago. Open up our eyes to see who you are, what you've done, what you're preparing for us, so that we might say, Jesus, what you have done is so amazing. What you're preparing for me is so glorious that you're worth it. And that we would do so not with gritted teeth, but with a grateful heart. Do that work among us, Lord. And then you know there are others of us who are just tied up in knots. We're trying to follow you. We're trying to reach out to people in our sphere of influence. We know that's what you're calling us to, but we're doing it out of this sense that it's up to us to make something happen. I pray, Lord, may your word of freedom cut through all of that perfectionistic spirit right now. Help us to receive this word, that it's not about us, it's about you and your word. So Holy Spirit, do that work even now in us and among us and ultimately through us for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Let's worship as we close. Please stand with us.